there's a lot out in the audience, not everyone that hasn't robbed a bank. Um, I'm not going to name names. <laughs> no, and you don't need to show hands. But planning, uh, planning a robbery on a, a, a bank. Like, uh, talk, talk us through that because most of us, we watch it on TV. We don't know the, know the world. Russell and I worked in the armed hold-up squad. We understand you know, bank robberies. Tell us about the uh, uh, one that you've been charged with, by the way. Yes, yeah, yeah. so probably do, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just definitely one <laughs> second. I'll take yeah. this off, guys, and we'll have a conversation. But no, nah, more down in Melbourne, I suppose. You know, for us, I, my father being that disciplinary, uh, he taught me to really aim as high as you possibly can. So when we went out and did, <laughs> 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 unfortunately, it sort of reflected into the choices I made made within life. And the Melbourne Arm Robbery Squad weren't too impressed by it by the end of it. But, um, mate, we you know, did a whole heap of planning, drive down there, fake IDs, you know, fake ho- check into the hotel under a fake name. Um, we get into a factory, turn the alarm off, take a uh, BMW M5, prep, prep, um, prep, place some stuff. We realised we might be under surveillance. I'll pick up on that. So I say, let's go and look at this other bank and we'll get them to set up at this other bank. And which is weird. I, uh, at that point in time, I was saying to myself, we should just pull, pull the pin. Spoke to one of the boys and said, mate, I'm happy to pull the pin and get done for the car because they'd seen us in the car. Um, we kicked on and they, sure enough, they set up at the other bank and we robbed the other bank while they were um, at the other one. They realised and get across to the other bank that they'd sort of watched us just look at quickly. Um, and at that point in time, as we're coming out, they're out the front of the bank. We jump in the car and we're off and, and off to the races. A lot of planning, a lot of details. 3 a.m. in the morning, we drive the route um, back in the day and make sure if you turn left here, was there a bump, was there... Was it a tight street? Could somebody possibly walk out? I was, I was, I had a weird sense, even during that bank robbery, there was a young kid that was crying. I'm sledgehammering in the safe. You can imagine the sledgehammer on the safe inside. It sounds like a gunshot to be straight out. And I pass it on to a co-accused at the time, run outside, who's got the kid, walk out of the bank, high five, we're shooting a movie. It's only a joke. And, yeah, unfortunately, um, you look back on it, and I had no intentions for anybody to get hurt, but us to obviously survive. I, I, I think you showing that uh, that care was taken into account on, on that one on, on sentencing. On, and, unfortunately, and my co accused got, <laughs> got got the rap for that, but <laughs> <laughs> I would have liked to have got it because I got the longer sentence with the, the yeah. worst history. And um, But in the end, you know, it was just something, that weird morality of being in that moment and caring for a kid and, yeah. and making sure that nobody got hurt Well, it, it shows in our head. You, yeah, you, it shows that you you got some humanity there. You hadn't lost touch with the complete humanity. What's the longest sentence you got? Longest ten years with seven on the bottom. That was the one in Melbourne. Uh, what what goes like? Just think. Just put your, yourself in uh, Jeff's position. You get sentenced to ten years. It, it would seem like a lifetime. How old were you, and what was going through your head? I would have been thirty at the time. And I was just thinking, oh, I'm going to get... I did five before that, so I got uh, ten with a five, which means you serve five years no matter what, depending on your behaviour in jail. You might get out after five years. Uh, in, on this one, ten years with seven on the bottom, and I'm just thinking uh, at that point in time, I'm starting to... The cogs are turning. Next sentence is going to be 15 years or something. Do you want to get out when you're 65 and you've got more in you? And, mate, there's so many coppers that sat me down... You know, even the local sergeant up here who knew me really well at Newtown, and he said, "Mate, you've got so much more in you." And you know, um, it's those little conversations were building confidence in me. And as much as we didn't talk to the police, I'd always I'd sit there with my arms folded, but I'd be listening and saying, "I'll take snippets of this person. What's he telling me?" And, and I was always respectful in that sense, um, uh, but also at that point in time, respectful to the criminal world as well. How did you survive prison? Like prison's a, a, a tough place, and you, you've got to be tough, or you're not not going to survive. And uh, what what was your experience in prison? <laughs> left left hook and right <laughs> right straight, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and, and be I think you know once again, my father. Ta- I was willing to go to the end at that point in time, and you, you got to think about. And I'm not the only one in there with that mentality, and it's pretty crazy. So I become a really good negotiate I suppose and and started to learn how to conversate with people listen and learn as my grandmother taught me I wish I listened to that about 20 years earlier but um, for me you know I was able to take those conversations and really 
de-escalate some of the most serious situations, which turned into murders out on the street uh, and, you know, people arrested for those murders, um, where I'd jump in between those two people and say, hey, he's, while we're here, let's all get on. And uh, I started to realise, hey, I've got a bit of a skill here and maybe I could do this in, in another space. And I just had to come out and find my way. And similar to um, uh, uh, the efforts as a young kid, I stepped into the space where, you know, we travel around the, the globe uh, delivering leadership and well-being and I knew if I could just flip that mentality, create a better reality around who I wanted to be, um, create that vision and step into it. And what? I took those lessons as blessings from police officers, um, community members and, and, yeah, it's changed my life and I'm grateful for it. What was the wor uh, watershed moment when you are in prison? Because you decided to get uh, educate yourself and you did you make a decision, this life is not for me? Did, was it that clear cut? Like it was a, a, an epiphany? You just woke up one day and said, Absolutely. no more? Uh, I, I just, I got to a point in that Melbourne robbery, I we always had this golden rule, if anyone could get off, we'll go and say whatever we needed to say. Um, we, uh, uh, I go to trial, I'm the only one that can possibly get off. Trial's going really well. Colin Lovett, who did the Greg Domasevich case, which was the baby in the dam. Um, yep. He represented me, paid a mint to have him represent me, try and get off something that I did clearly. But um, it was going really well. And by the end of it, um, I'd asked my co-accused at that point in time to come and sort of um, help me say what needed to be said. And they said some things, things happened and transpired. And I went one way and they went another and that was it. Um, never looked back and I just went, you know, the sum of all the efforts, the education, the feelings behind it, why were you doing it? Is it about the money? Could you make money elsewhere? Was it about the girls? Could you go, go? That or that whole mentality, you, I think you're just in so much. Jail doesn't give you time to think. As you're literally looking over your shoulder and every day is just a, a battlefield. And I think... Well, I, I've heard people uh, yeah, saying that every time the cell door opens, you wonder whether you're going to walk back in in one piece. Absolutely. Or walk back in at all. Every single morning I was showered and ready to go out into the yard. By the time that door clicked, because if what would happen, that door would click, the officer would go four doors down, someone would walk in and shut the door and click it behind you. And now you've got someone in front of you with a, uh, what they call a shiv or a knife. And well, now it's on like Donkey Kong. And, and you know, some people would probably be happy with that. Um, but, you know, in the end, a lot of the a lot of the people there, I'd, they're so broken, and, and the conversations with them, I know that if they had a choice, and they would be able to see different um, a different way, they'd take that step. And for me, I, I've been able to be that beacon and see so many other people do it. You know, Russ, Dan out here, big shout out to them because they're doing it in real time. And and there's so many others that have got great skills that could be used elsewhere um, to benefit the community. So you go back in the prisons now. Prisons, juvenile justice centres around the globe with corporates, schools, communities, organisations. You're, you're everywhere. Remember, <laughs> we hadn't seen each other for a bit and I turn up down to uh, Canberra to do a keynote at this leadership uh, <laughs> conference and who's hosting it? Jeff. <laughs> I think we shocked the audience where we said we know each other from and what our past were, but uh, a anyway. Um, how, do you, how do you find that? Like you go, going in and uh, trying to steer people in the right direction. Biggest thing is, like, as a community, and this is for everyone that sits here, we try and tell someone don't do something, right? We all want to lose that weight January 1st, but the habit and ritual behind you as an individual is well entrenched in yourself. So getting someone to see the value and benefit of that conversation to them as an individual, uh, you know, I go back in and I ask them, mate, I'll do it standing on my head when I speak to these inmates. And that's something that we'd all say, including me, 10 with a 7, my co accused was laughing at the judge at the time when we got sentenced. I was like, oh, my God, we're going to get longer. That's not clever. Be quiet, you know. Like, and, but in the end, um, being able to speak to the inmates and say to themselves, if I gave you the key today, would you walk out the door? And they said, yes. I said, so what you're telling me is that you – are doing what you're doing for a particular reason, but you don't like being here. So as much as you could do it standing on your head, you'd walk out the door. And that starts to transition um, what I call a light bulb moment and allow them to step away from it. And, you know, there's many people that have come here tonight that I know and I was in custody with that have changed their life around and a big shout out to them all.